Okay. Welcome to episode 79 of the Super Sports Show. I'm Eric Eager. I'm alone today again. Uh, it's Friday afternoon. I'm excited uh, to get going here. We're going to try something new here. We're going to play the music after I do the preview. Today, we're going to talk about Quinn and Williams uh, extension, what that means uh, for Chris Jones. We are going to talk about DeAndre Hopkins, where he could be going as a result of that. We're also going to talk uh, about the quarterback. Uh, we're going to talk about the quarterback um, documentary, uh, as well as uh, the NFC North preview uh, to, to cap off the week. So should be a good time. Uh, let's go ahead and play the music. Okay, we're back. All right, so episode 79 of the Super Sports Show. Um, like I said, I'm Eric Eager. Thomas Mitchell is not here. He will be here Monday. However, it is Thomas's birthday. So anybody who knows Thomas, uh, go ahead and wish him a happy birthday. Uh, he's been uh, just a wonderful friend uh, and boss at Super Sports. I, I do want to recap kind of the, the week that was this week for us at Sumer because it has been a, a heck of a week. Um, Monday, Thomas and I talked about, uh, you know, the, the data that is inherent uh, in the NFL and what that, you know, where people are as far as, uh, you know, where people are as far as, you know, charting data versus uh, tracking data versus traditional scouting data. Uh, it was a very, very good uh, article, if I do say so myself, and I do say so myself. Um, so that was, that was an enjoyable time. Uh, and then Wednesday, uh, my colleague, Tej Seth, with Parker Funding on vacation, he went ahead and interviewed uh, former Falcons director of analytics, John Teramina. Um, John's a big reason why I'm at Sumer, because uh, I did a ton of work for him when he, with him, when, when he was with the Falcons. Uh, and then that is how I kind of got to know Thomas Dimitrov. And, and uh, you, you sort of gain trust there. He's at True Media. Uh, he does wonderful work there. In fact, um, they and Genius Sports uh, just extended a deal with the NFL. Uh, so that's a very exciting stuff for them. Uh, and it's great to see him uh, grow uh, and prosper. We also had a couple um, articles on the website. Firstly, it was me uh, uh, writing about the AFC South. If you go to sumersports.com, uh, you will see an AFC South divisional preview. I previewed the AFC South a couple weeks ago on this, uh, on this pod, on this Friday podcast. Um, but uh, as I will, the NFC North today. Uh, and, you know, there's some good tidbits in there. There's some good uh, sort of market-based things as well. We aren't going to explicitly talk about gambling, um, but it is good to sort of reference uh, where people go um, at, at relative to the markets. Uh, we, do have, um, we do have some comments that are coming in here, actually, Brett. Brandon, bro, happy birthday to Mitch Rob. Biggest news of the week, of course, being the return of the Tampa Bay Team Skulls. Absolutely. And I think unless the Detroit Lions counter with their 1980s, 1990s uniforms, it will be only a partial win for us as fans uh, and, and, and in the league. Mojo, one of our, our uh, uh, frequent uh, commenters, says Thomas's birthday is on Bastille Day That's all, uh, as well. Um, so, yeah, that was that was one um, you know piece there. The AFC South. Go ahead and read it. We will have one of those every single week, uh, starting you know this week and then Monday next week. We will have the NFC North, which we'll which we'll close talking about as well. Another article. This is actually makes me very happy because this was written uh, by one of our interns, McKenna Hack, who uh, was a student at Ohio State, uh, one of our summer interns here at Sumer. She wrote an article talking about the continued emergence of the mobile quarterback. Uh, a very cool look into the evolution. Uh, of this great league that uh, we love, actually, John, who, again, was the Wednesday guest, uh, sort of joked about uh, sort of Michael Vick's singularity uh, in the league before 
um, we, we started getting more passers who were adept at, at running uh, with the football and being mobile. So those are a couple of things. We are going to continue to have uh, content on supersports.com. We're going to go ahead and and uh, start opening up some some tools and some uh, you know newsletter type type uh, elements for people starting next month uh, and into the start of the season. So it's an incredibly um, exciting time uh, to be a consumer of the consumer uh, side of the, the Super Sports brand. So that'll that'll be a good uh, a good time. Um, as as far as, as as we let sort of people sort of get into both not only the YouTube here uh, but also the the Twitter sphere. With respect to uh, you know the, the, this live show here, uh, we want to thank all of you for subscribing. We've built up our subscriber base a little bit over the past uh, few weeks. Uh, if you are not a subscriber to our uh, newsletter, which will be coming up soon, go to sumersports.com backslash the zone. Uh, and of course, if you haven't subscribed to this YouTube channel uh, that this podcast is on, please go ahead and do that as well. There will be um, some cool things coming up. We are on episode 80 Monday. It'll be 100 before you know it. We'll have something special for the 100th episode. We are also um, co-sponsoring a sports analytics meetup uh, in the in the city of Atlanta coming up over the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. Sean uh, Clement uh, tweeted that out, which was uh, you know very cool. And 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 again, uh, a couple of our summer interns actually were a part of those sports analytics meetups in uh, Cincinnati, where where I used to live. Um, competed in the big data bowl, ended up getting internships at Sumer. So that, uh, again, if you're looking to get, you know, breaking into to sports analytics, I can't think of a better uh, opportunity than that. Uh, so thinking about opportunity, uh, the Jets have an opportunity this season to go ahead and win the Super Bowl for the first time uh, since the, the fourth Super Bowl um, when they defeated the uh, Baltimore Colts. Uh, with Joe Namath uh, famously uh, predicting that he would do so uh, and route to the Hall of Fame. Uh, obviously, this year, you know, they go ahead and get Aaron Rodgers. They get some of Aaron Rodgers' lackeys uh, on the team. Uh, and that's really been the most important part uh, of the uh, of the offseason for the Jets. Uh, but secondarily was what they were going to do with Quinton Williams. Quinton Williams is the third overall pick in 2019. He's been a very good defender. In fact, he was the subject of an article that I wrote at Pro Football Focus on New Year's Eve in 2020, which was saying interior defensive linemen matter. Um, he is a big reason why they can do some of the stuff that they do coverage-wise, right? So, um, you know, and, and, and our friend uh, Jason Fitzgerald from Over the Cap remarked yesterday how there are more interior defensive linemen that have, you know, kind of what I would call max deals now than, than exterior edge defenders, uh, and, and, you know, we've seen some people, uh, my former colleague, Deontay Lee, uh, Nate Tice, son of Mike Tice, uh, former Vikings head coach, kind of opine on, you know, it's not about premium positions. It's not. About, and and I, I'll push back a little bit. For one, you know, interior defensive lineman is a premium position at this point, right? It's, it's incredibly difficult to get a premium player like that in free agency. Javon Hargrave went from, uh, Philadelphia to, to San Francisco. He's the kind of in what third contract mode there. So I don't know necessarily if that counts, but again, per Fitzgerald that over the cap, like premium position is defined as being able like accessibility or lack of accessibility through the free agency market means premium positions, right? So um, you talk about the, the premier edge players in the league, you generally speaking have to acquire them either through the draft or through a trade uh, quarterbacks premier quarterbacks you have to acquire via draft or via trade wide receivers is sort of becoming that way corner is a little bit interesting i think it's an important position but you can you know it's not quite to my you know to my liking the top of the premium position and then positions who aren't premium like linebacker safety running back tight end those are positions that you can acquire top end talent in the free agency market and i think defensive interior has sort of made its way more into that that conversation of the past few years and a lot of it is is narrative driven a lot of it's statistic statistics driven um there was a time back in i think 2018 where there was a a twitter spat at times by my my former colleague george shahuri myself and you know nfl network cynthia freeland over the fact that a lot of coaches said interior pressure was um was a uh very much a um you know a thing that people didn't want to um you know, didn't didn't want to, to play against because it was 
it was owners on the offense. And we did a study and basically said, yeah, interior pressure sucks for an offense, um, but edge pressure actually still is more valuable. And things like strip sacks and things like quick pressure were why edge was a little bit more valuable there than, than uh, interior. However, I think that some of the calculus changes have, um, have, you know, when you think about two high shells and you think about these, this increase in sort of kind of play coverage, I think you can make an argument that defensive interior has actually closed the gap a little bit um, from edge players because, you know, having a stout defensive lineman will allow you to play deeper coverage, which will allow you to defend the pass better. So even though edge pressure, when it does happen, is more valuable than interior pressure, interior defensive linemen allow you to play a little bit of a different numbers game and allow you to have more of an edge there when it comes to being able to play the numbers. We've seen teams that have tried to play the two high shells and stuff like that and tried to be small defensively and tried to do so without the requisite defensive linemen fail miserably. You know, the Los Angeles Chargers famously in 2021 giving up uh, that 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 drive to the Vegas Raiders uh, to kick themselves out of the playoffs. And Cleveland being another one, Cleveland, a very analytical team, very smart team, does a lot of things right try to do some of those things without the benefit of good interior defensive linemen and were gashed against the run at times over the past few years. They, of course, go out and get a guy like Dalvin Tomlinson, um, you know, there. Uh, funny, uh, my, my, my nephew, John, and, and niece, McKenna, go Uncle Eric there. We'd love to see them on the feed as well. Uh, and that, one of our other summer interns, uh, Ashley Brew, love the shout out for the Social Atlanta, New Realm Brewing in Atlanta. Come check it out. Yeah, Ashley's one of our our other great interns um, at Sumer Sports. Uh, so that'll, you know, again, uh, as, as we build the community here, we, we continue to sort of, uh, we branch out. There's actually a rumor that they're going to have one next two weeks from now in Philadelphia while I'm there teaching my class uh, at, at uh, Wharton. Um, but that I don't think that's been announced yet. So, um, but back to the sort of idea of, of Williams and obviously the value of interior defenders, because it does track into this discussion that we've been having over the past few months in Kansas City with Chris Jones. Uh, there is a super short about it. Uh, if you go to the, our, our YouTube page again, subscribe, rate, review, help us grow the show. Chris Jones is next up, right? And Chris Jones, I think, has been waiting and waiting and waiting for the Dexter Lawrences and the Deron Paynes and, the, and the, those types of players to continue to get their contracts so he can slide in as sort of the rightful owner of the second highest contract at the interior defensive line um, position in the NFL. And for the most, Jeffrey Simmons, for the most part, those contracts have not been favorable to Jones. There have been, you know, I, I, I think Jones is probably, I don't know, predicting that at least one player at this point in time would have a, a, a contract APY that was 25 million uh, or more. And, you know, ultimately that has not happened. And, you know, even Williams at, at four years, 96, you're looking at 24 million APY. So Jones, you know, right now, 28 million is his current cap hit. 20 million was the APY in his last deal. I think he can reasonably ask for 25, but that still doesn't necessarily get him any very close to the Donald number, which again is, is I think where he was trying to trend. So this could get complicated in Kansas City because you have, you know, not that much in cap space. You have a fan base that maybe rightfully or wrongly has been clamoring for DeAndre Hopkins, uh, wide receiver who was released by Arizona. And the requisite step to acquiring him or another veteran player, frankly, at this point, is to extend Jones, drop his cap number, um, drop his cap number down a little bit, slide in Hopkins. We, we talked about cash versus cap on a different one uh, podcast recently, but again, there, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion necessarily that Jones is going to get this extension all time, all, all that quickly. Maybe I'm going to be wrong in the the Friday news dump happens and it happens like right in front of us. Um, but again, uh, I, I don't think it's it's a foregone conclusion there. The markets, though, have been moving towards Hopkins going to the Chiefs, which, again, is a is a would end up being somewhat of a corollary of Jones getting that extension. Here are the current or the market numbers as of this morning for DeAndre Hopkins to take his next step. The Titans were big favorites, I think minus 300 early in the week. They're down to minus 125, which again is better than break even, better than 50-50 in terms of break even. 
um, but but significantly lower than what it, where it was previously. The Patriots are two to one. The Chiefs uh, are at plus two twenty five. So you bet a hundred, win two twenty five, and then everybody else is fifteen to one or more. The Chiefs were sixteen to one last week at this you know at, at this juncture. So the numbers have moved towards uh, towards Kansas City a tad. There are a couple of caveats that I will say when you look at these markets, though. A, the limits are low. Um, I remember when my my former colleague and, and good friend, uh, friend Ben Brown and I, when we found out that there was news that Brady was going to Tampa Bay, the most we got eleven to one. Uh, the most we were able to get down on something like that offshore even was two hundred dollars. So you're you're not looking at like markets that you're able to bet a ton at. If you are a sharp account, you know what I mean is you're a person that wins a lot, and, and if you're a person that wins a lot of things like the draft and stuff like that, see these informational markets. I, I'm guessing your limits are going to be even lower, uh, and, and you know in many places you can't even bet this information because you know for for reasons I'm not, I'm not exactly sure why. For example, you can't bet the draft in some states, but you can in others. You can't bet this information in some states and the others. So. You know, it, it's kind of, I wouldn't say these markets are sharp or liquid, but they do give an idea of where kind of the news is going on a week uh, to week basis. So again, Williams gets his extension well earned. I think he's really done a great job there in New York. That defense has turned itself around. Um, you know, the Jets are favored to go to the playoffs this year, in large part because of Rodgers. But Williams, uh, Quinn and Williams very much has been worth the third overall pick from Alabama in 2019. Uh, Chris Jones still not extended. I think he'll come in right above Quinton Williams, which may be disappointing for Jones in his camp, especially because this is his third contract. This is uh, Williams' second. So I think Jones really wants to cash in one more time before the age curve has started to hit and, and hopefully does with Kansas City. Hopkins, uh, you know, trending towards Kansas City, still an underdog to go there. But, um, uh, you know, there, there is movement there. Uh, we get a, a message here from Yusuf Cockbane. <laughs> Uh, greetings from the UK. Absolutely. Hello. Uh, we all, we thank you all for coming. Uh, again, subscribe, rate, review. Uh, we'd love for you to become a part uh, of the Sumer uh, family here. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the quarterback document. Now, I got to be honest with you, I'm only two episodes in. And one of the reasons I'm only two, two episodes in, and I, I decided sort of, um, you know, to, um, I, I decided, uh, you know, just a, a yesterday on a whim to watch it a because the the cfl game i was watching you know hamilton ended up having a huge lead it wasn't compelling so i started watching it but the other reason is you know as a kansas city fan um and as somebody who grew up in minnesota watching the vikings still pay a lot of attention to it some of my best friends are vikings fans like i, I felt like i already knew a decent amount about Kirk cousins and patrick mahomes um but i i i was taken i was taken aback by a few things i think the first one is Mahomes really is a psycho. I think that he has that sort of like crazy demeanor that that Michael Jordan gonna he's going to be offended slash motivated by the littlest of things uh, to the point where you know I I think that um, I, I think that his his standing as the league's best quarterback is going to be unequivocal for a while, and that's just because you. You watch the one episode where they talk about his torque and how he how much he trains to be able to make those throws. It's funny because when I watch it, it looks so natural, but it's very clear that a lot of work goes into Patrick Mahomes and you know sort of how he can sort of rig the league um, by being so great with arm angles and movement and all that. And it's very clearly something that he works at and he understands is his edge uh, physically, in addition to the clear edge he has mentally, which is that. He just wants to be the best and, uh, you know, he, he's satisfied with nothing else. Uh, so that was like, and, and you sort of knew that about Mahomes. I mean, the fact that, you know, he did what he did when he was injured the way he was in the playoffs in the Super Bowl, uh, you know, it's really, a, I think, a harbinger of, you know, what's to come for him. Um, but it was it was fun to see that in the documentary. And then, you know, Cousins has, has been a quarterback who I've been very critical of in the past um, I did not like his first contract. I did not like his second contract. I think his current contract's fine. I think, honestly, given all the decisions Quasi has made, I think some of them are questionable. But given that all of them that they have made, I think it's probably the right move for them to extend him now because they clearly didn't want Will Levis for whatever reason. They didn't want uh, last season, you know, Pickett or Willis, possibly for good reasons. But 
given all the decisions they've made at the position, like Cousins is probably their best option for the next two years. And, and I've been critical of him for a lot of reasons. And I think that this humanizes him a little bit. Um, it, it makes, it shows kind of very explicitly some of the uh, insecurities that he has. Uh, he made a quote by Margaret Thatcher, which I thought was funny. Uh, and, and we do know that, you know, kind of some of his, you know, we know his background a little bit on that. But um, what I what I really thought was cool was Kevin O'Connell and Kevin O'Connell very clearly understood what his assignment was. And, and I think it's good to it, it's good that he came into that position in Minnesota, first time head coach, knowing where his predecessor failed. Mike Zimmer was a head coach in Minnesota that in 2015 won a division, 2017 won a division, went to the NFC title game on the back of his defense for in large part. In 2015, Teddy Bridgewater was just kind of an okay quarterback, um, you know, was ascending certainly. And then in 2017 was Case Keenum, very like the backup of backup quarterbacks. And that defense was, you know, carried them basically all those seasons. And I think it it was not. I mean, Ray Charles could see that he didn't want Kirk Cousins uh, on that team, and you know, even though Cousins, I think, has performed admirably at times, and you know, probably didn't live up to his contract, but probably lived up to a description of a pretty good quarterback. Mike Zimmer was was always, in some ways, trying to prove that prediction right, and I think with a quarterback like Cousins, very clearly has these insecurities. I don't know if they came from from working for Zimmer or they were something that Zimmer had a heart. They were existing before and Zimmer didn't play into Kevin O'Connell very much played into him. And there was this, there was a scene where they go to Washington, obviously where Kirk started his career, um, you know, kind of from a fourth round pick overtook RG three had a really torrid finish to 2015, kind of an okay or very good 16. And then like just an okay 17. That's why they let him go and traded for Alex Smith. But they go there, and they only score 20 points. They're down 17-7. It's not a great day for the offense and not a great great day for Kirk Cousins. And yet Kirk makes a couple plays. They go ahead and win. And in the locker room after, Kevin O'Connell said, the only reason we're 6-1, and one, the only reason we are where we are is because of our quarterback. And while I'm watching, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, well, that's not true. Like, that Justin Jefferson is the best non-quarterback in all of football. Um the defense had created turnovers. I think Harrison Smith had a long interception return in that game. They got some pressure, all this stuff. Offense block, you know, Dalvin Cook made a one-handed catch for a touchdown on a ball thrown by Cousins. Like, they're very clearly – and I think Mike Zimmer would have said that. I think Mike Zimmer would have said, look, like, it was a great team effort. We won despite – he, he might not have said that explicitly, but I think he would have given off those vibes. And yet Kevin O'Connell – knew like no this was a situation he goes back to his old team they win a tough game he was a tough son of a bitch in that game he took a lot of hits a lot of pressure and he he encouraged him now that's probably not enough to win a super bowl with him but it's probably enough to you know win 13 games when you otherwise would win nine or something like that so i really i really came out of that uh you know watching the first couple episodes there and obviously i'll finish at some point soon I came out of watching the first few episodes of that show thinking to myself, like Kevin O'Connell really understood the assignment of being a head coach with a quarterback who's pretty good but limited. And um, but the contrast could not have been bigger between Cousins and 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 Mahomes. And I think like if you're a Vikings fan, and we'll talk about the NFC North coming up in a second here, uh, before we get to our ad read here. Um, I think if you're a Vikings fan, you realize by watching that show and watching kind of where Mahomes is as a player and where, you know, the the fact that the distance between him and any other guy, let alone your guy, is so big, it's going to take a lot for you to win a Super Bowl. I do think that Kevin O'Connell is going to give the Minnesota Vikings with Kirk Cousins, as long as that happens, as good of a chance as they have. Whereas I thought maybe Mike Zimmer, especially when that roster was better around Cousins, I think 2018, 2019, I think, like, he was a net negative on the margins relative to the quarterback and the limitations uh they're up so it was a it was kind of an interesting you know in my opinion a very interesting um you know a, a very interesting look into um the, the the sort of what it takes to be a quarterback and what it takes to i think more importantly coach a quarterback who is not perfect which is all but one guy in the league frankly uh and to various degrees so um okay speaking of imperfect las vegas las vegas is a fun place uh there's a lot to do 
It's hot as hell, though. And it's hot as hell this time of year all the way until you get into the early parts of the season. However, our friends at Circus Sports try to help with that. They have the best, in my opinion, American sports book uh, in the entire country. Um, they also have some of the coolest uh, uh, you know, contests, the millions, which is basically picking five games every week, uh, quarterly prizes, halfway through prizes, and then, of course, a uh, million-dollar prize at the end. They also have the uh, survivor competition where you pick one team every single week to win straight up. Don't care about the spread. Uh, and, 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 you know, and the, and the last people there uh, obviously get the, the pot. Those are two great competitions. I've taken part in both of them during my time prior to Sumer. Uh, and, and I really enjoyed them greatly. Uh, you can go ahead and sign up with them. Uh, you have to be in Vegas to do so, but you can play every single You don't have to go to Vegas to play every week. You can play through a proxy, um, but you have to go back there to sign up. But luckily, and this is getting to it, my uh, a couple of my colleagues and I will be out there in late August for week zero of the college football playoff season or college football season uh, to do this podcast to help people, uh, you know, to, to hang out with people at Circa, talk to them about football, talk to them about uh, sports in general. And you can go ahead if you come and join us there, you can sign up there. It, it, uh, you can sign up there at Circa. And to, to complete this, the imperfections, the, the, the how hot it is in Vegas that time of year. Circa has solved this problem with a a a a, uh, a spectacle like no other, which is Stadium Swim, which is this very cool uh, pool slash uh, sports watching slash sports betting, uh, you know, uh, set, uh, which is outdoors in in old Vegas, in old downtown. It's a lot of fun. So go ahead, end of the month. I think it's like August twenty sixth or something like that. We will be there. Um, but until then, you can still sign up uh, at, at, with our friends at Circus Sports. So. Speaking of, that's the last week of the NFL preseason, by the way, uh, which will start to see things crystallize as far as the league is concerned. Um, and, you know, the best part about preseason is that the odds change. Uh, odds change for, for playoffs, odds change for Super Bowl, injuries, but also we get a little bit of like, hey, look at how Jordan Love's doing. Look at all that kind of stuff. And, and so as such, we at Sumer want to be your companion as you um, go ahead uh, and, and prepare and, you know, just like we did with the AFC South, which, again, go to supersports.com, the zone on the bottom part, you can go to our divisional preview for the AFC South. We're going to talk about the AFC North today. We're going to publish that on Monday uh, on supersports.com, which you're going to get a free preview today. Um, the NFC North is, is, in my opinion, one of the more interesting divisions in all of football because you have two teams that had winning records last year. You had three teams that were in the playoff hunt all the way into week 18. Uh, Detroit lost out on a chance when Seattle beat the Los Angeles Rams at home in week 18. And then Green Bay lost out on a shot when Detroit beat them at home uh, to, to, to win that last Sunday night game. Uh, Detroit, nothing to play for. Dan Campbell's team came to play and ended up winning that game 20 to 16. Obviously, the Minnesota Vikings, they went 13 to 4. They had a negative point differential, though, and as three-point favorites in the playoffs against the Giants, they went ahead and lost by seven. Uh, Kirk Cousins checked it down to TJ Hawkinson on fourth and eight. Hawkinson was unable to break a tackle. That was their season. They went ahead and lost to uh, a 9-7-1 and one New York Giants team. So Chicago gained the first overall pick by virtue, as we talked about last week, or two weeks ago, I'm sorry, uh, of Houston beating Indianapolis in week seven, uh, week 18, the, the Lovey Smith bleep you to uh, what is now his his former squad. So that's kind of how it goes. So three teams were contending-ish last year, and Chicago was had the worst record in all of football. You re-rack it this year, and a few things. Chicago fans are excited. Uh, that's a that's one thing to think about if you if you're thinking about you know uh, fighting a tank, for example, if you are a NFL fan. Bears tank last year, and their fans were as excited as, as it could be. They traded the first overall pick, uh, you know, for the for the ninth pick. Uh, Carolina moved back uh, and got a bevy uh, of resources, including DJ Moore, uh, to go play with Justin Fields. Uh, and you know that was a you know that that was a move that they made, and, and they built it up a little bit uh, here and there as far as Moore and, and guys like. Uh, Tremaine Edmonds and, and as well as TJ Edwards, they, they've done a decent job of building rosters. I, I'm still a little bit worried about their pass rush, um, and, and as such, and you know, 
to that end, I think we look at the predictions here. We still have the Bears, and this is our this is our our our, our simulation. We still only have the Bears with a thirty point seven chance to make the playoffs, but we are all the way from three wins to seven point three wins in the projections. There, there, every team in this division has a strength of schedule that is above zero. Meaning, again, on the right hand side, every team's game is at least uh, at least zero points harder than the average team on a neutral field. Uh, we do have the Bears with a 5.1% chance of getting the first pick uh, again, uh, followed by Green Bay at 3.2, Vikings at 2.0, the, the Lions at 1.6. So the Bears are creeping there. I think, though, win total of 7.5 in the marketplace, I think that, that, that they're, they're pegged probably pretty rightly by uh, the market. Um, so there's really not, I, I think, any more to say there. I think Fields is obviously the big thing. If Fields plays tremendous this year, the Bears are set. If he plays poorly, then they have picks and resources to go up and replace him with Caleb Williams, Drake May, um, or, or if they want to wait till like late round one or round two, Bo Nix or something like that. Um, you know, uh, Joe Milton, if you're if you're Parker Fleming, my colleague there. So I think that the Bears, when you look at their projection, um, it, it's kind of right on market there, and it's because you know they they don't have the easiest schedule in the world. Um, and they they have questions at quarterback and, and frankly questions at head coach. I think Matt Eberflus was really good last year at in-game decisions, but um, you don't necessarily know um, because they didn't have high stakes last year. Uh, you know what to expect. And and one of my one of my good friends, in the league, I, I'm not going to say his name, but he says, you know, uh, I think Brian Holes has done you know a fairly reasonable job, but it, it's it's easier when the you know, when the problem is to tear down and not win. The question is now, like, can you now win? And so I think polls is past the first test. I, I'm worried about maybe the, the second test. Uh, and, and mostly I'm just worried about, I think expectations are maybe a little bit too high for year two. I think year three uh, might be might be the year where they where they do better. Um, to, to, you know, third place in this division, both last year and in the projections are Green Bay. Now, when I say third place, I mean in the market. The, the market, the Packers have a 7.5 win total. The Vikings have an 8.5 win total. We actually at Subaru, like Green Bay, a little bit more than Minnesota. Partially is that right-hand side where the Packers have a, a slightly easier schedule per game than they do. Um, but this is where I'm going to make a bull case on one team in this division, where I think of Matt LaFleur, A, in-game decisions, he's very good. He had a hiccup against Tampa Bay in the NFC Championship game in 2020, where he kicked the field goal down eight to put it to five, then kicked off. Didn't kick it. Like it was it was weird. And I, and I know the Deck Prism sports guys liked it. And Deck Prism is about as sharp as it gets. They they do the live odds for surface sports um, there. So it's hard to disagree with them. I think a lot of other models said that they should should not have kicked the field goal, that they should have gone for it. So, again, the questionable one. But, again, I, I think Green Bay is, is much better around Aaron Rodgers or was much better around Aaron Rodgers than they were given credit for. And I know Joe Barry's given a lot of flack. For, for being a defensive coordinator that has not reached expectations. And I know um, defensively they were hyped up a little bit last year and it was did not come to fruition. Some of it was because Rashawn Gary got hurt. Some of it was because uh, of you know not being able to stop the run and kind of having a poor approach defensively. That's the one question I have is the approach because I think the talent is there. They get Gary back. Um, Preston Smith's obviously very good. Devondre Campbell was an all-pro in 2021 was pretty good still last year. Rasul Douglas, Jair Alexander, um, they lose Adrian Amos, but Amos had fallen off a little bit. Uh, and then Quay Walker, Devontae Wyatt, like those are two guys who I think everybody had penciled in as the reason why that defense was going to be good last year because they come out of Georgia. But as we've said a lot of times, maybe on this show, but also my Twitter at, at Eric Eager underscore, like draft picks don't generally affect the team the year they're drafted on average. I think – they're going to be better for this team this year. Uh, and, and and as such, like I'm buying into Green Bay. You go to the offensive side of the ball, Christian Watson was wonderful in the second half of last year. A lot of it was variance. A lot of it was touchdowns. The fantasy community is going to sort of look at those. But I even think about being able to stretch the field. You know, he was a rich man, Marquez Valdez Scantling for them. And we we talked a, a, at length about the, the value of positions like that, uh, you know, players like that in the NFL at that position. I do worry a little bit about depth. Like Romeo Dobbs was was okay last year, not great. Um, they they drafted a few a couple of tight ends that I think will come in and, and really help there. Aaron Jones needs to get the football more. 
relative to AJ Dillon. I think Dillon's a good kind of low variance back, but um, but again, I think that Aaron Jones is a more explosive player, especially in the passing game. The offensive line should be okay. Bakhtiari has missed a few seasons in a row ish, and that has hurt them. But I think that they're better off on the offensive line. And then I think that the assignment for Jordan Love is to just color within the lines. I think Rodgers was mostly for better, but sometimes for worse, an artist. And he would, you know, the San Francisco playoff game in 21, you know, uh, Devontae Adams is down the field, but Alan Lazard is wide open on the cross. He throws it downfield. He basically sinks their opportunity to go to another NFC title game that year and host it. Um, I think that Jordan Love has, A, the talent um, to come in and be kind of a plus, like kind of be a Kirk-tier quarterback, but with a plus physicality, athleticism, and arm strength. And I think Matt LaFleur is not given enough credit for taking a, a, a team who was nine, is six, nine, and one in 2018 and a quarterback in Aaron Rodgers who even into 2019 when they won 13 games had struggled to the point where drafting Jordan Love was a reasonable outcome. Taking him to two MVPs and two more 13-win seasons and even last year where – that team was broken for a lot of times. And, and all the way down to at least literally Aaron Rodgers' thumb was broken. And getting that team into a position to actually, you know, have a chance to make the playoffs and be kind of a hot playoff team, I think Matt LaFleur deserves a lot more credit than people are giving than he, people are giving him. And I think if he, I don't think convincing Jordan Love to color, color between the lines is going to be that hard. And I don't think that if – in the NFC, Jordan Love coloring between the lines is not good enough to make the playoffs. And so I, I like Green Bay. Um, and, I, and I don't know if it's necessarily even at the expense of a team like Minnesota or Detroit, even though, as, as you'll see here against uh, our, our projections here, even though relative to market numbers, we don't like Detroit or Minnesota. The Vikings have a win total of eight and a half. We make it more like seven and a half. The Lions have a win total of nine and a half. We make it more like 8.7. Like, I don't think that that's necessarily because we don't like those two teams. It's more that we like Green Bay. I think Minnesota, you know, is the clear like regression candidate in the NFL this year, right? They do 13 and four negative point differential, a quarterback who's getting a little older, even though has played well, you know, defensively, they lose Patrick Peterson. They lose um, Zadaria Smith. They lose Eric Kendrick. Now, some of those guys had faded down the stretch and, and, you know, but, much like when I was making the bear case for the Vikings in 2020, when they lost Trey Waynes, and people were like, oh, but they are they weren't Trey Waynes wasn't good. It's like, yes, but you still have to replace a player who is a starting caliber player in the NFL. And that is not trivial. And I, so I look at the Vikings and I think, you know, defense doesn't matter as much as offense, but that defense is going to have some growing pains. They they drafted about you know four corners that I think. They want to play for them over the last few years. So far, the returns have been bad. I mean, Andrew Booth hasn't really played much. He's been injured. And Caleb Evans has had his moments, but he's also had like three concussions. Um, you know, Makai Beck, like you, you have, uh, you know, you have some guys coming in that I think have potential as well. Quaid is very clearly playing the numbers game at corner, which I think is sharp, but though they have to work out and they have to work out this year for them to be successful this year, of course. Lewis Seen is currently not even running with the starters at safety next to Harrison Smith, who had to take a pay cut to stay. And at linebacker, it's, it's Brian Osamoa next to Jordan Hicks. Again, a lot of projection to make them good. Go to the defensive line, and we talked about this on uh, a Sumer Short and a Sumer Sports Show about a month ago. We don't know what's going to happen with Danell Hunter. Danell Hunter doesn't play for the Vikings this year because he's traded. They, I don't know what's going to happen with them past years. DJ Wanham has had some sacks in his career, but it's not been very – productive as a pass rusher for when you talk about pressures and stuff like that defense is probably the reason they don't make the playoffs because the offense is pretty good. I mean, Jordan Addison projects to be fairly solid. KJ Osborne had a, has had a good two years now. It's number three. Um, in fact, I thought it was better than Adam Thielen last year for most of the year. TJ Hawkinson and Josh Oliver should be good tight ends. I, I think the offensive line, you have two very good tackles, Pro Bowl level tackles. Uh, and, you know, um, a center in Garrett Bradbury, who was pretty bad for a while, but was okay, at least league, league average-ish last year. The running back position doesn't really matter to me that much, but they do have Alexander Madison, who's played 
uh, good football when he's been in the stead of Dalvin Cook. Uh, and they got some backs behind him that, you know, Dwayne McBride, uh, Kenny Nwangwu, guys like that who I think will be, you know, passable there. So, you know, the Vikings could go either way. I think it's going to be high variance. I think that their defense is going to probably keep them from being true contenders, but Cousins can obviously, if he can play high in football, they can they can compete. Uh, schedule's not nearly as easy as it was last year, so there there is that. Uh, but O'Connell's a plus coach, and so we'll see. That they, I I certainly am not writing them off. And and then Detroit is like I said, Detroit's here. They are the favorite by our simulation, um, but it's 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 prohibitive here. I mean, they're plus one forty five or so on the market. We make them plus two hundred or so. So we would not advise this year at all, like I did last year on PFF. I I, you know, don't, I, I'm not, you know, advising any bets, but I would say, you know, Detroit's being overvalued. And, and I think it makes some sense why. I mean, Dan Campbell looks to be a great head coach. They kept both coordinators. Um, you know, the offensive line's tremendous. Defensive line with James Houston and obviously Aiden Hutchinson, that, that should be very good. Ali McNeil came on a little bit last year. And then they, you know, they got Jack Campbell in the first round. They, you know, they, they largely missed the playoffs last year because they could not stop a nosebleed against the run in key games against Seattle and Carolina. Uh, for example, Seattle for the tiebreaker and Carolina at the end, if they simply win that game on the road and finish the year with a win uh, against Green Bay, they're in at 10 and 7. Instead, they, they had to, they missed the tiebreaker with Seattle. Um, they should be better there. I don't know by how much. And to their credit, they did play the numbers game in the secondary with Sutton, Emmanuel Mosley, uh, Chauncey Gardner Johnson. Like, I think that that's, going to be better. Kirby Joseph was much better uh, in terms of getting interceptions and stuff than he was uh, in the preseason where we really struggled in coverage. Now, think you know, don't over-index on PFF grade with Kirby Joseph because we know that for safety is very unstable, very interception dependent, which we know is is mostly noise. Um, but he certainly performed better than um, than kind of the narratives uh, surrounding him. So there, there's stuff to like defensively. I don't think their defense is going to be so good, though, that they should be, you know, much more than plus 150 favorites in that division. Offense with Goff and, and Johnson, like we know that Goff can run a top five offense when his, his coordinator is good and his coordinator is good. They bring Jameer Gibbs to really help. I thought DeAndre Swift, numbers were good. They have five yards carry, all that kind of stuff. But you watch the games and it's like, can't make really anybody miss. He doesn't have great vision. Gibbs should be an improvement there. Uh, I worry, you know, Laporta tight end, that's a really good addition. I, I'll buy any Iowa tight end, um, uh, you know, as being a good football player. Amon Rossi Brown's terrific, but he has been banged up in the past. And the games where Amon Rossi Brown was not um, healthy, they were, you know, they got shut up by New England. They, they uh, faded in the second half of the Vikings game, uh, the, the first one that they lost. So keeping him healthy is important because, you know, they brought in Marvin Jones. They passed up Jackson Smith and Jigwa twice, which I thought was interesting as far as a, a, they must have believed that he was a slot player, much like my co-host on here, Thomas Mitroff. They passed on him. Um, Jamison Williams, of course, the gambling suspension. That was unfortunate. Uh, they bring back Marvin Jones. Like, I think that there's, you know, something there, there as far as a weakness at wide receiver. That would be one week that I would look at. If I'm looking to fade Detroit, I think the weakness at wide receiver past Am Amon Ross and Brown is the place to look. But Detroit's the favorite in this division. I think they should be. I just think that maybe they're too favored by the market uh, is, is where I'm going to go there. So, you know, and, and all this is written up in the article. There's much more deep analysis there. But that's kind of my overview of the NFC North. Like I said, the, this is where we are on the numbers. Uh, you know, again, uh, Lions at 8.7 wins. Uh, we, we went by number of wins projected in the division for order. So AFC South was worse. NFC North, second worst. Um, NFC West will be the week after, by the way. They're third worst so far. Um, so this division, I think that there's a lot of excitement. I think every fan base believes, and rightfully so, that each of the teams can contend. But when you add it up, it's not a great division. Uh, so I, I, I'm interested to see who comes out on top there. Um, that's basically it. I'm, uh, you know, obviously, uh, we'll, we're happy to take some questions from the the live crowd here uh, on this. Again, we covered a lot of ground. We covered Quinn and Williams uh, re-signing with the Jets. We covered, um, you know, the, a little bit of the quarterback documentary. We covered some Chris Jones and DeAndre Hopkins talk, and then we, we finished with some NFC North talk. 
Um, this has been a lot of fun. Obviously, uh, you know, as the summer months kind of come to a close, we'll continue to sort of sharpen our ideas uh, of what's going to happen uh, in the NFL, division by division, team by team, narrative by narrative. On Monday, Thomas and I are going to talk about interior defensive linemen versus edge. If you go through the, 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 the history of the Patriots drafting when Thomas was director of college scouting, then on to the Falcons, a lot of interior defensive linemen taken high. Not that many edges taken high. And I wonder if we're o- either we're overfitting what Belichick likes to do or maybe the league is catching up to something that Belichick had really understood this entire time and, and, and we're, we're finally uh, you know getting there. So um, we actually have one more one question here from Oliver. Duval, highest floor and highest ceiling in the NFC North. So I think Detroit has the highest ceiling. I think Detroit could be the one seed. I think if all the, the questions that I have about them um, don't materialize, namely Amon Ross St. Brown is healthy. JMO comes in after six weeks is, is good. Marvin Jones still has something left. The tight end Laporta can, can make things happen. And Jameer Gibbs is a playmaker in addition to just being a running back, I think that they can have high ceiling. Highest floor to me um, is also Detroit. And I think the, one of the reasons is because they're so good on both offensive and defensive line. And, and that you can't win just with an offensive and defensive line, but you can certainly not lose, uh, you know, if, if those two things are, are some of your strengths. Chibos here. Where are my fellow eager beavers on Twitch? That's a good question. We started uploading Twitch a few months ago. Uh, we, you know, if, if that is your preferred medium, go ahead and jump on there. We'd love to continue to get people, uh, content there. Um, franchise. Yeah. So this is, uh, Gerd doing work, um, franchise tag, uh, uh, coming Monday. Yes, exactly. So, um, these guys have, you know, basically a certain, you know, deadline to sign their, their, their you know, sign their franchise tag, I think sign an extension as well. Uh, questions about Saquon Barkley, questions about Josh Jacobs. I was on Zach Gelb's show just before this one. Uh, and we were talking about it. I made the prediction that I think Jacobs plays on the tag. I think that Barkley gets an extension. Giants are pretty sharp, though. And, and not to say that sharp just coincides with um, – sharper uh, coincides with with paying or not paying a running back. But I do think there will be some resistance there. Uh, Barkley um, and, and Jacobs, though, they are, some of the few, you're, they are some of the few players in the league that can actually hold out. If you are on contract, you can hold out, but it's going to cost you – a ton of money per holdout day. If you are not on contract, we saw this with with um, Orlando Brown in Kansas City last year. You can literally hold out like an old school holdout because you are not under contract. You are not uh, subject to those fines. So that is something to, to consider as well when thinking about uh, what what people are going to do. So um, seeing no more questions, um, we're going to go ahead and and end this podcast. Thank you all for joining again. Like I said, at Super Sports on Twitter at Sumer Sports underscore on uh, threads. I don't think threads are going to last that much longer. I mean, that's a prediction I'm going to make. Um, and we're going to, you know, but but we're we're on there. We grabbed that name. We, we had the original at Sumer Sports and then on Instagram, and then we just never used Instagram. I think we got picked off. So that 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 should uh, tell you uh, uh, maybe how much of a, of a boomer maybe, uh, you know, I can be, or maybe an older millennial uh, I can be. Um, but yeah, go ahead and watch us on threads. Um, at, we're going to continue to sort of produce more of this. We're, we have, again, me and Thomas on Monday. I think Tage is going to go. Tage Parker, maybe uh, a guest uh, in the middle of the week, and then I'm going to do uh, the, the following week. So, okay. So, have a happy weekend. Enjoy the last few weeks we have before football. I'm Eric Eager. This has been episode 79 of the Super Sports Show. Have a great weekend, everybody.